Good evening and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Bible Study in the Book of Revelation. Tonight is study number 8 of Revelation chapter 3. And we're currently looking at verse 3, which says, Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. And we've seen, as we've been looking at the second half of this verse, that God commands um, his people to watch. He commanded the churches and congregations of the world, which were his representatives upon the earth, to the, the inhabitants of this world. He commanded them to keep watch for the coming of Christ, to watch for the judgment, first of all, upon the churches and congregations if they failed to be faithful. And the, the churches did fail to be faithful. And the Lord Jesus Christ did come in judgment as a thief in the night upon the churches of the world. He came silently. He came spiritually in uh, removing his spirit from them in taking away the light of the gospel and, and ending salvation within the churches and congregations. And he did this following 1955 years of the church age on May 21 in the year 1988, the day before Pentecost. And then God continued to judge them for 23 years complete years, a full and exact 8,400 days before transitioning that judgment on to the world. And Judgment Day began on the world on May 21, 2011. And again, the Lord has come as a thief in the night, where the world, just as the church before them, is ignorant is unknowing, has no understanding of the judgment of God upon them. They, they do not realize that God did as he said he would when he had this message of Judgment Day proclaimed to all the earth, May 21, 2011, Judgment Day, the day the door would shut, went around the world. And that's exactly what God did. He shut the door to heaven, and Christ is the only door, the only entryway into the kingdom of God. God shut that door 7,000 years after the flood on the very day, 7,000 years later, that he had shut Noah and his family into the ark. On the date of May 21 of our calendar, which had the underlying Hebrew calendar date of the 17th day of the second month, the date that matched the, the day in the book of Genesis concerning Noah and the flood. Well, the Lord has come as a thief in the night. Well, then we have some questions. And let's turn to Second Peter chapter 3, and we'll read verses 10 through 12 where it says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Now, uh, before we discuss verse 10 here of Second Peter 3, which states that Christ will come as a thief in the night, in the day of the Lord, let's also recognize that in verse 12, the Lord is telling us, the believers, to look for that day, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God. And again, where do we look? Do we, do we keep our heads 
tilted in an upward angle, gazing into the sky? No, no, that, that, that would be useless. We're not to look physically with our eyes into the sky, looking intently, looking carefully as Christ coming. I don't see him yet on the clouds. No, that's a waste of time. When God commands for us to look, and, and this is a command, it is directing us to look into the Bible with an intense gaze to look for the coming day of God. And that commandment of God goes contrary to the uh, dictates of the churches and congregations and many people today when, when they tell us, well, don't bother looking because you'll never see anything. You'll never be able to know anything about the coming of Christ. So why bother? And, and of course, God uh, has other ideas and, and uh, we, we listen to God. We don't listen to what men say. We don't listen to what churches say or popes or bishops or priests or ministers or elders or deacons or any individual child of God. We listen only to the Bible. And God gives us a, a wonderful privilege of being able to search the scriptures for any truth whatsoever. We can dig into the Bible concerning the doctrine of annihilation, or we can dig into the Bible concerning Christ on the cross, or or women's role in teaching, or uh, issues with marriage, or the coming of Christ. It is our privilege as elect children of God. We, we are permitted by God, and therefore that's the only permission we need. We don't look for anyone else to permit this. The, the subject today is taboo with the world and the church. Well, okay, that's fine. That, they, they don't have to like it. They don't have to approve of it. They can condemn it all they want. We don't listen to them. We don't look to them for approval and, and for acceptance. We look only to God, and God permits it, and that's all the believer needs. We were thankful for this great privilege that God allows us to search these things concerning times and seasons, although he would have us know that certainly we can't know anything of ourselves. It's not in us. It's not of you, he says in Acts 1, to know the times or the seasons, that the, these things are in the Father's power. And we recognize that. And so we pray for wisdom. Oh, Lord, if it's of your good pleasure and of your will, your perfect will for us, then would you kindly reveal this truth as you reveal any other truth to us and open up our understanding to realize what your program is for the end time. And, and yet we also would pray understanding that God has already done a great deal of this as he has revealed to his people the biblical calendar of history in which we are able to establish timelines for the church age and the end of the church age, timelines for the Great Tribulation, which is the period of judgment upon the churches, timelines for the latter rain, timelines for Judgment Day itself occurring on May 21, 2011, and a good possibility of the timeline for the Day of Judgment of 1600 days. These things are all uh, given by God. And, and we look into the Bible, not outside. We, we don't seek any other information uh, in addition to the Bible or apart from the Bible, but only in the Bible. If it's in the Bible, and if God is pleased to open up our mind's eye to understand these things, as he says, the wise will understand, but none of the wicked will, well, then, okay, we, we have been given something by God. He has revealed it to us, and we are thankful to him for it 
as we're thankful for any truth that, that he opens to our understanding. Well, uh, now in Second Peter 3.10 again, it says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. And the day of the Lord here is referring to Judgment Day. Now, judgment began on the house of God, on the churches and congregations of the world. And Christ came as a thief upon them. But judgment in view here also is related to the world itself. And the Lord has come as a thief upon the people of the world. They might have heard the declaration that this day was approaching. May 21 was coming. But for all intents and purposes, and uh, since they were unsaved, they were in darkness. And, and they dismissed the information. They wrote it off, most of them. They, uh, they, they didn't believe it, and so on. And, and so they did not hearken to God at all. Even if they did uh, recognize it or acknowledge it intellectually, the fact that they didn't break before him and fall down daily upon their knees, crying out, beseeching him for mercy, would indicate they did not hearken. They, they did not take warning in the sense that the information was designed to provoke in the sinner that we would beseech the Lord for all it's worth, that he might have mercy and we might experience his salvation completely by his grace. And so that day was foretold by God. We did know the day and hour. The day was May 21 of 2011. That was the time for judgment. And it was foretold and Christ came as declared And yet, the world did not see him. They did not see anything outwardly happen to them or to this earth. And they rejoiced. And they exulted. And they mocked and reviled and ridiculed those that said that such a thing was going to happen. Nothing happened. It it was a great victory from the world's perspective for the world itself uh, against this ridiculous notion of an end brought about by some invisible God and and some long dead person named Jesus Christ. It, it was a, a total victory. And yet God warns, he warns in the book of Job that the triumphing of the wicked is short, but a moment. It only lasts for a moment. And God says that, actually, because that phrase, uh, for a moment, relates to the day of judgment. Well, let me, let me find that verse in the book of Job. It's in Job chapter 20, and it says in verse 4, Knowest thou not this of old, since man was placed upon earth, that the triumphing of the wicked is short? and the joy of the hypocrite, but for a moment. Now, I say that phrase, for a moment, relates to Judgment Day, because, remember what we read in Isaiah chapter 26, in verse 20. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers, and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. And again, this verse has everything to do with our present time of judgment. The moment is speaking of this period of time from the beginning, again on May 21, 2011, until the conclusion of this day of judgment, which could be 1,600 days. It is all but a moment, and it is the time of the triumphing of the wicked. They finally uh, put an end to the annoying and pesky uh, declarations concerning the coming of Christ. This was it. 
you see, because this was the most serious, the most intense, the, the most um, worldwide spread of the news of Judgment Day that there has ever been. There is no parallel to what we have recently witnessed when this message carried across all the earth and to every nation. and It was unprecedented. There was no equivalent in history uh, where so many people in so many places heard the declaration from the Bible that there would be a judgment upon them as a result of their sin. And so this was it. And, and there was fear amongst people, nervousness and anxiety as the day approached. And finally it came and nothing happened outwardly, physically. Nothing happened that had been spoken of concerning a great earthquake and concerning a resurrection of the dead and so forth. So the world breathed a collective sigh of relief and they relaxed and they let go with exuberant joy, triumphing over finally the most serious of warnings that the world has ever seen. Nothing happened. This was nothing like all the previous warnings concerning a date. No, this was completely based upon the Bible. It was delivered by the most serious of gospel ministries and faithful. And all of the true believers were involved, the serious students of the Bible. And again, nothing happened. Now, the, the world could forget all about this once and for all. Never again would it ever listen to such a uh, thing, such ridiculous things concerning the coming of Christ and the end of the world. That was it. That was the last hearing that this kind of message would ever get. It was a final and complete triumph over these things. And yet, and yet, the Lord Jesus Christ came, as he said, as a thief in the night. Such a brilliant, such a masterful thief to rob the world of the, the tremendous, valuable thing of the gospel. To remove it right out from under the nose of the world without them having any idea that it's been taken from them, to remove the uh, glorious light of the gospel and the hope of salvation, to remove the blessings of the Spirit of God concerning God's Spirit's ability to create new hearts, to remove these things from the world and steal them away and rob mankind of all future hope of salvation, to really steal life away from the world and to leave the world in death, to steal light and leave the world in darkness. This is what God did when he came on May 21 of 2011, and he brought about the day of judgment exactly as he said it would be. Now, we might have as the world, and we did, perceive what God was saying in his word in an inaccurate way. We had thought, well, the world operates in the physical realm. The world operates in things that it sees and can, can hear and touch and feel. And therefore, God will bring a judgment befitting that. He will bring a judgment they will see and and be able to touch and experience and understand this is the judgment of God. And we look forward to the world's realization that all that we had said to them was true. And now they'll see, now they'll, they'll get it, and they'll understand why we shared these things with them. And we were disappointed. Oh, nothing happened as we had thought. But, you see, God is, 
it, it's his privilege, it's his prerogative to reveal a certain truth. And it is perfect truth. And yet not reveal everything, every characteristic about that truth. What I mean is, for example, consider what God said again. Yes, we've gone over this, but let's go over it again. What he said in the Garden of Eden when he, he spoke to Adam and to Eve as a result because they were the only living people. And he said in Genesis 2, beginning in verse 16, And Jehovah God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now, God is making a matter-of-fact statement. Look, you eat of this tree, and in that day, no other, that same day, that very day, you will surely die. It is spoken in absolute terms, just as the warning to the world, May 21, 2011, exclamation point. It is absolutely going to happen. Yes, we spoke that in absolute terms because that's what we found on the pages of the Bible is God locked in that particular date. Well, God spoke in absolute terms also when he warned Adam and Eve of what would happen if they disobeyed and ate of the fruit of that particular tree. Well, uh, there was no need to wait very long, and Adam and Eve did eat of the fruit of that tree. And what happened? What happened if, if uh, we were uh, privileged or permitted to be an outward observer at that time? Of course, we, we couldn't have been. They were the only living people. But, but what happened to them? What would any outward observer have seen when they ate of the tree that God said they were not to eat of when they disobeyed God. Did they fall down dead immediately? No. Well, then, did they get sick and ill and, and die later in that same day? No, that didn't happen either. They, as a matter of fact, they, they didn't die that day at all. They, they didn't die for hundreds of years. It, well, we know this concerning Adam anyway. God doesn't give us this kind of detail concerning Eve's life, but we do know concerning Adam. It says in Genesis 5, in verse 1, This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them, and blessed them, and called their name Adam. In the day when they were created, and Adam lived a hundred and thirty years, and begat a son in his own likeness after his image, and called his name Seth. And the days of Adam, after he had begotten Seth, were eight hundred years, and he begat sons and daughters. And all the days that Adam lived were nine hundred and thirty years, and he died." Hundreds and hundreds of years later, after he rebelled against God and ate of the fruit that his wife Eve had given him, who also rebelled against God, 800 years after Seth was born, and Seth was born when he was 130, Adam died at the ripe old age of 930 years of age. Hundreds of years later, there's no question that what God said, In the day you eat thereof, ye shall surely die. And there's no question he did not die that day, but died centuries later. Now, of course, we know the answer from searching the rest of the Bible, that Adam died spiritually in that day. He died in transgressing the law of God. He died in his soul existence. So did Eve. And all who would be born after them would be 
born spiritually dead. And that's why we need to be born again and receive a new resurrected soul because we're dead in soul, dead in spirit as a result of that first sin. And yes, that's true. But the point is that God did not warn Adam and Eve, as we read Genesis 2, 16 and 17, in the day you eat thereof, ye will surely die spiritually in your soul existence. God didn't say that at all. He did not get specific. And instead, the Lord, in his wisdom, chose to speak in a general term concerning the death they would die. And an outward observer might have heard that warning given to Adam and Eve, and the day you eat thereof you will die, and then heard what Satan had said when he was trying to deceive Eve. Let me read in Genesis 3 from verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which Jehovah God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Well, there is the contest between God and the devil between what God has declared and what the devil has declared. And what happened? Remember, just imagine an outward observer hearing the warning of God, yet a very unspecified warning, not specific at all, but a general warning. And and man's natural tendency to think in an earthly, physical sense. And then Satan saying, look, you can eat of that fruit of that tree. Don't worry, you're not going to die. And Adam and Eve do eat, and they do not die physically. Certainly, anyone could say, well, uh, Adam and Eve did not die. The devil was correct. They did not die as thought, as it had been said by the Lord, that they would die. And you see, Outwardly, we have to be very careful. It, it's according to God's good pleasure. He could have uh, been very detailed-oriented. He could have told us exactly what he had in mind by Adam and Eve dying in that day, but he did not. Likewise, God could have told us in advance, before the Day of Judgment, that May 21 would be completely spiritual. He could have opened up the understanding of his people to this truth. It, it, who who would say he could not? What we understand about the Bible is completely in Christ's hands. He's the one who gives us wisdom and insight. And yet God held back that information and he instead just revealed to us the certainty, the seriousness, and the finality of May 21, 2011 being Judgment Day. And he left it for us to learn afterwards that it would be a spiritual judgment that would come upon the world.